Hey y'all, it's Heal Heat time. Hi everybody and welcome to Heal Heat. My name is George Coles and this is an episode of It Came From The Network. Now on It Came From The Network we review the, the bad, the weird, the campy, the funny, and sometimes just downright terrible stuff you can find on the WWE Network. Kind of an homage to Mystery Science Theater 3000. This review is of WCW Halloween Havoc 1998 and it was suggested to us by our friend Almighty Santa. So let's jump right into it. First match of the night for the WCW television title Raven vs. Chris Jericho. This was an okay match. Uh, this was shortly after Saturn had freed the flock from Raven and Raven had to go out and alone. He was working on a somewhat depressed gimmick. And during the match we seen Jericho get Raven to tap out and even the announcer said normally Raven is able to endure a ton of pain but he just doesn't seem to have his heart in it anymore. Basically insinuating that his heart was broken and he lost the flock. Jericho picks up the win. Afterwards, we see Canyon come out, which would start the whole Raven and Canyon combination. But a decent opener to the show. Uh, you know, it, it had two great wrestlers, Raven, one of the most underused guys in WCW, and Jericho as well, who would go on to bigger and better things in the WWE, actually. But a great opener for the show. Next up, we have what good old JR would call a hoss fight. Ming versus Wrath. This was a, a match to showcase Wrath and how tough he was and how much of an up-and-coming badass he was going to be. So Wrath picks up the win. They didn't really, the match never really clicked. They didn't really have the chemistry, in my opinion. Um, as you've seen before, I'm a big fan of Ming, a.k.a. Haku. I think he did a lot of great stuff in his career. Unfortunately, he just didn't match up well. Sometimes that happens. Next we have for the number one contendership of the Cruiserweight Championship, Disco Inferno versus Juventud Guerrero. This was when Disco was trying to become a Cruiserweight and lying about his weight. <sighs> to me, uh, and Disco picks up the win, to me, there were so much better cruiserweights in the company at the time than Disco, Disco Inferno, who, I don't know, just, this wasn't a place for him. Kind of felt like they were making fun of the cruiserweight division in a way. I would rather have seen Hoovy win, because we'll see the, the match later, which I think would have been a better match if Hoovy won. Next up, we have Fit Finley versus Alex Wright. This was in the time when Alex Wright was trying to say he was the best wrestler from Europe. Hence why he's wrestling Fit Finley. We get a good amount of backstory on this about how Finley had wrestled Alex Wright's father before. And, you know, a decent, okay match. To me, Alex Wright was a guy that he could do all the moves... He just didn't have the charisma to pull it off. He was good in the ring, solid talent, just couldn't connect with the fans, no matter how many times they tried. It's an okay match. Alex picks up the win. Again, it was another attempt to get Alex right some momentum behind him. Next up, we have Lodi. Lodi, formerly of the Flock versus Saturn, the guy who ended the flock and you know some of the flock guys weren't happy about it Lodi was one of them we see him wrestling Saturn more so this was another another um, way to split Saturn more off from the flock he came with a little bit of a different look had a, a chainmail jacket and a, a biker hat kind of kind of a cross between an army ranger and a biker this was a way to kind of keep Saturn going, a guy that they were starting to build up into bigger things. Saturn picks up the win. It was a good match to have on the show. Next up, we have the Cruiserweight Championship match. The aforementioned Disco Inferno versus Billy Kidman, who had just recently came from the flock, 
and went from his ripped up t-shirt and ripped up jeans and scratching gimmick to the more front, more popular jean shorts and wife beater white t-shirt or white tank top. Funny thing before we go into this, if a little bit of a weird backstory on Kidman. During his time on the flock, the whole itching gimmick and the seven year itch, Raven has said in, in interviews that that was supposed to, you were supposed to, or it was supposed to be an homage to Kidman being a heroin addict. And no one at WCW picked up on it. They The whole gimmick thing was based on him having, you know, a drug addiction and being a heroin addict, which is kind of weird that that submersive kind of backstory was into the into that that they never picked up on, which shows you how much that they cared about some of their mid card talent, which was one of the big issues with WCW. Anyway, Kidman picks up the win as he should have. It would have been a much better match with Juventud Guerrera or maybe a different cruiserweight, Dean Malenko, Ultimo Dragon, Rey Mysterio, come to mind, Chris Jericho who was wrestling sometimes as a cruiserweight. Even some of the other guys, Hector Garza, Super Calo. They had some really good cruiserweight talent. Disco wasn't one of them. Not to say that Disco didn't have his spots, just he wasn't a cruiserweight. Next up we have Scott Steiner and the Giant defending the WCW Tag Championships, which was actually Hall and the Giants, versus Rick Steiner and Buff Bagwell. Now this was set up earlier in the night, the first thing we see in the night, and I, sorry I forgot to mention it, was Rick Steiner was doing an interview, Scott and the Giant come out, which brings out Buff Bagwell who said he's sick and tired of Scott Steiner, Big Papa Pump, he's going to side with Rick Steiner, setting up this tag match, and if they win, Rick gets a solo match against Scott Steiner. Midway between, through the match, Buff Bagwell does a double turn, turns on Rick Steiner, and leaves him basically two on one against Giant and Steiner. Giant makes a mistake, hits Steiner. Rick picks up the win, which leads us right into Rick Steiner versus Scott Steiner in the seemingly never ending Steiner Brothers versus each other feud. We get Rick versus Scott, which becomes a convoluted mess where Buff Bagwell in a totally different suit comes out and Stevie Ray come to attack Rick. However, Rick finds a way to fend them off and pick up the win over his brother Scott. Just, I don't know, could have been simplified. Again, this was them doing too many swerve and turns and was just silly. They could have just had Rick versus Scott Steiner, something that the fans actually did want to see, me being one of them. You know, Steiner brothers were, were a great team during the 90s. It was always, who's the better Steiner, Rick or Scott? We finally had our opportunity. They convoluted it. Now, speaking of a team that separated, we got the Outsiders coming up next. Scott Hall versus Kevin Nash. This was the time where they were doing the Scott Halls and alcoholic gimmick, which it touches home because it rings true to his true life. And a little bit, I don't know, Phil... Going back now even, and even at the time, I felt a little uneasy with this because there was a little bit too true to heart. And I don't think those gimmicks ever helped the guy that's actually having issues. They did a similar thing in WWF with Jake the Snake Roberts um, and, you know, poured alcohol down his mouth. I don't think bringing their personal issues up on TV helps. Just saying. That being said, Hall and Nash put on a pretty good match. Hall wins by countout when Nash hits a jackknife powerbomb and just lets, lets him lay in the ring as he walks away from him. Kevin Nash actually never wanted to wrestle Scott Hall. He still wanted to be best friends. Unfortunately, we get what this was. Now, next up, we have Brett the Hitman Hart versus Sting. In what should have been a dream match of wrestlers in the 90s, Unfortunately, this was weird wolf pack sting, which the less said about that, the less bet the better off we are. And WCW Bret Hart, who only pretty much half-assed it through most of his WCW tenure. Let's be honest, folks. Bret Hart's heart 
was not into his WCW run, and they had no idea what to do with him. And at this point, Sting was in probably the worst portion of Sting in his career. The WCW, or in, in WCW as the Wolfpack Sting. Decent match, Bret Hart picks up the win. I, I just... I think they could have been better with these two. I mean, again, it was a dream match. These guys, at one point, Sting was the face of WCW and Bret Hart was the face of WWF. This could have been a dream match that really didn't hit on any cylinders. Next up, we have one of the worst matches I've ever seen in my entire life. Hollywood Hulk Hogan versus The Warrior. This was the rematch from a match at WrestleMania 6. It was terrible. Um, the fact that I believe they gave him 20, 25 minutes, Warrior could not go that long anymore. Um, in WrestleMania 6, it was a great main event. I believe it was about a half hour match then. And they really stole the show. And they really showed Hogan at the height of his popularity, Warrior at the height of his popularity. And they really put on a good, interesting match. This match, however, we see Hulk Hogan starting to decline physically. And at this time, he had really, the, the injuries were starting to take up a toll on him. The Warrior was a shell of his self, of his former WWE self. And who knows how much of his heart was into this, because this match was terrible. It was a glorified way for Hogan to pick up his win back on the Warrior. I mean, you had everything in it, a bad fireball thrown by Hogan that didn't even go out of his hands. You had Horace Hogan, who Hulk Hogan beat up the week before and gave stitches to. Supposedly sided with the Warrior, but came out and helped Hulk Hogan. I don't know, just... One of the worst matches that's ever been on a pay-per-view in my opinion, and it just drug the whole thing down. Now next up is another controversial match, but not because of the quality. We have DDP versus Bill Goldberg for the World WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Now, going back in history, and one of the reasons why people look at this pay-per-view so negatively is about a minute in it, for most people, it cut off. They cut the feed because they went over. They went 11 minutes over, or 15 minutes over their time. They were to get supposed to get off of the pay-per-view at 11 p.m. sharp. Now, WCW thinking, you know, they're bringing in pay-per-view buys. They're going to go as long as they want. Unfortunately, they went over. And I believe in something like 75 to 80 percent of the country the people that were running the pay-per-views cut it off and just said, okay, you're at 11 o'clock, it's cut off. Most of the companies weren't right into the replay. Or, you know, because that's where they made their money. They made their money off of somebody's going to buy the first show, maybe somebody that worked while the first show was on, or for whatever reason, or somebody in the West Coast will buy the replay, and so on and so forth. They made their money off of the first showing is where they made their major money, but they did also make money off of replay. So they cut it off. A lot of companies went right into the replay. Most of the most of the country did not get to see this main event. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I cannot remember if when I initially seen the show, if I seen it live with the show or not, because the very next night on Nitro, they attempted to make it right by showing the match in its entirety on Nitro. Which, why did you spend $60 a night before? Again, WCW and their infinite wisdom. And I've also seen this version, and I've also watched the pay-per-view another time since the time of it. I, um, I got, believe it or not, a VHS tape of it. Yes, it it's that old, um, when Blockbuster Video was going out of business for a dollar or something like that. So I watched it again. You know, I figured a dollar, who cares? It's a dollar, right? 
Anyway, so I don't remember if I honestly seen this match the first time around with the pay-per-view or in my sus subsequent viewings that it's been involved, but it's part of this pay-per-view. A lot of the reason why people hated this pay-per-view was because it got cut. DDP and Goldberg go on to put on a fantastic match. I think this is one of Goldberg's best matches and definitely one of DDP's as well. I would honestly put it on either one of the two's highlight reels. I thought it was that good of a match. And I'm not a huge fan of either. I like DDP. I very much dislike Goldberg. I never was a fan. I never bought into the hype. But this was a great match that he was in. Goldberg picks up the win, continues his streak, which leads to very shortly after being ended by Kevin Nash. Spoiler alert, as if you need one almost 20 years later. But anyway, a great match that a lot of the country didn't get to see after struggling through the pay-per-view. Now, the reason that's such a bad thing is because, again, we had so much filler. Disco versus Hooventude for the wrestling for the number one contendership could have been put on Nitro or Thunder or even Saturday night and took that time to help, you know, keep the main event in there. Or the whole Rick Scott Steiner, Buff Bagwell, and the Giant getting involved could have condensed down to Rick versus Scott. Again, creating a little bit more time. Just my just my own personal views, I think they over convoluted a couple things which made the pay per view run long, which left the best match of the night off for a good portion of the country. I want to say it was somewhere around 80%. I could be wrong the, of the country that missed it. So four out of five people that bought the pay-per-view didn't get to see the main event. Which is terrible. Although they did get to see it the next night on Nitro, that's not the point. You pay, I think it was 40 or $50 at the time. You want to see Goldberg versus DDP. Believe me, folks, there wasn't many people that were buying this for Hogan versus the Warrior. Sure, there was a couple, probably, I would say, 5 to 10% of the audience that was a big match for. The other 90% of people wanted to see DDP versus Goldberg, because they were both extremely popular at the time. But anyway, I digress on that. We're going to go right into the ratings for this. We have a 1 to... <laughs> A 1 to 5 scale here, 1 being the worst, 5 being the best. 1 is a gobbledygooker, 2 is a renegade, 3 three is a hurricane helms, 4 is a gold dust, and 5 is a king. We're going to give this show a 3, a hurricane helms. Some things I really enjoyed on here. Hall versus Nash, I thought it told a great story. Even though I'm not a fan of the alcoholic, in, alcoholic angle, I thought it was great how they were twisting this and how Nash didn't want to fight Hall. And then Hall goaded him into the match. Uh, DDP and Goldberg, like I said, was an excellent main event. Raven vs. Jericho was good. It was a solid match and it worked well with the gimmick that Raven was working at the time. Um, the attempts that they tried to make with new stars with Kidman, Saturn, Alex Wright, and Wrath, some were good, some were bad. I thought it was a good idea to try and make some of these guys stars. Saturn obviously went on to be a little bit better. Kidman as well. Wrath kind of toiled around a little bit till the Chronic run. And Alex Wright never really caught on. I mean, some of the pay-per-view was good. Some of it was bad. One of the worst matches i ever seen. But the main event is what makes a pay-per-view in my opinion. So there we go, we have it, we give it a 3, a Hurricane Helms, and basically, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you again to our friend Almighty Santa for recommending this, and if you want to recommend something, go down in the comments, make sure you hit like and share this video as well, comment and let us know what you want to see. Uh, what we're looking for is something you can find on the WC, or WCW the WWE Network, and we're looking for campy, weird, wild, and sometimes just downright bad pay-per-views. Give us a suggestion. I will put it onto my list of things to do. I have about six or seven suggestions from our friends out there that are coming up soon. 
So I'm going to try and knock them out in maybe a little while before I get to yours, but I promise I will get to yours if you have a suggestion of something you want me to review. But again, basically that's all I have to say about that. My name is George Coles, and this has been another episode of It Came From The Network.